If you can open up your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6, um, we're going through the life of Elijah. It's been, uh, I think, three weeks since we were last uh, <clears throat> in this series. Uh, John taught the, the last message, was, which was what, right before uh, VBS, and then the following Wednesday we had uh, the 4th of July um, baptisms. Um, and so... Uh, as we as we've been going through the the this series of the life of Elijah, uh, we've been uh, learning some things. Some of us uh, um, seeing some things about how looking at the life of Elijah, we can see um, many things that that the miracles that he that that he did um, were a picture of what was to come. Uh, we got to remember that Elijah um, was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel, and um, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, was, be, um, compared to the southern kingdom, was, was bad. I mean, they, they were both in disobedient. They were both, um, you know, following their own ways. But um, the southern kingdom had a few kings um, that were, that were uh, good in the that did right in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says, the Northern Kingdom, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, had no kings that did good in the sight of the Lord. So, as you can imagine, that, that the the um, the state that uh, Israel was in at that time, the Northern Kingdom, was pretty bad. And so, um, God had already used Elijah um, to to prophesy to um, the northern kingdom. And Elisha was following in his footsteps, um, but, you know, he was trying to uh, get the northern kingdom to, to turn back from their wicked ways and, and, to, and to basically turn back to, to God. Um, and that's, I think, um, that's a, a message that, that we definitely um, need to be hearing. It, it wasn't just for um, the, the Israelites, in, in those times, but it, it's also a, a definitely applicable to the church today. Um, so, uh, up to this point in our in scripture that we're in, um, depending on who you ask, uh, we have seen seven or eight uh, miracles performed. Um, the reason why I say depending on who you ask is because um, one of them, um, there's, you know, there's some uh, people that believe that it's not considered a miracle, but um, where two female bears mauled 42 youths. Um, I'm sure if you ask the youths, they probably would tell you that that was not a, a miracle. You know, that was more of a, you know, a, a disaster. But uh, needless uh, to say, you know, it was definitely something that Elijah had, um, had uh, the Bible says that he, he placed a curse on them because they were mocking him. And um, if you remember, that's when they were telling him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And, and um, so he went ahead and uh, placed the curse on them on the, in the name of the Lord. And immediately those two female bears um, mauled those, those youths. So in uh, chapter 5 of Second Kings, um, John taught, uh, his message was titled Restoration. Um, you know, two, two definite things that we saw in that was uh, one Naaman, a commander, of the Syrians, uh, Syrian king's army was healed from leprosy. He was a Gentile. Um, God tells us to be washed from our sins in the blood of Jesus to us, that uh, to every sinner, you know, he, he, he has called us. You know, just like Naaman um, went looking for, um, for uh, uh, Elisha and was hoping to be healed in, in when he got to to Elisha, Elisha didn't even go and meet him. He sent uh, his servant, uh, Gehazi, and um, gave him simple instructions to just go and wash in the Jordan River for uh, seven times and he will be cleansed. And uh, Naaman was kind of upset. I think sometimes, uh, a lot of times, we, we humans, we, we, you know, people tend to overthink things. We, we, we think that there's a, a, a more, um, there's more steps to being saved 
Um, you know, that, that it's, it, it can't be just that simple. Believe in your heart and confess uh, the Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that, that God raised him from the dead. It, it, there's got to be more to that. And I think that's the human, the, the human heart in us, right? We, we want, you know, what, what can I do to be saved? And it's like, well, just believe and, and confess, um, you know, and, and wash your, your, yourself in, um, in, in the blood of Jesus and your sins will be washed away. Um, Naaman went left and he was a little upset, um, but his commanders or his, uh, his uh, servants told him, hey, well, if he would have told you to do this, you know, go, go do this uh, extravagant thing, would you not have done it? Yeah. So why don't you just try it? Basically, tell him, well, what do you have to lose? Might as well try it, right? And he did it and uh, he obeyed and, and was healed and God was glorified because he confessed that there is no God but the God of Israel. And so, uh, you know, when we uh, accept Christ, when we come and, and just surrender to Christ and, and then he starts working in us, there's, I think those are the words that we, we pretty much proclaim to the people is that there is no other God but the God of Israel. You know, the God of Abraham, Jacob and Isaac, um, you know, and, and the, you know, those, that's definitely um, something uh, that, uh, you know, from, coming from a Gentile, you know, um, definitely glorifying God. Um, the second thing we saw was Gehazi, the servant of Elijah. He was a, a little more uh, a sad story. Uh, you know, he coveted the gifts that Naaman had offered Elijah as payment. You know, um, he should have known better, but it just goes to show it's not really about who you are, um, as, you know, bloodline or, or, or your... You know, it doesn't matter if you were born in the church. Um, you know, he was in Israel. I'm sure he knew about um, the statutes and the commandments of God. And, you know, he, his heart was in the wrong place. Um, and so that, that can go, you know, us. You know, it doesn't matter if you were born in the church, if you know the scriptures from when you were young. If your heart is not in the right place, you can end up like um, Gehazi. He, he lies to Naaman to acquire the silver and garments. And his disobedience caused him getting Naaman's leprosy. So now we, um, we turn to uh, chapter 6. And uh, it's only verses uh, 1 through 7 that I will be covering. And um, the title is called Reach. And uh, we'll see as we go through the message why, um, why the, that's, the, that's the case. But let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We give you honor and glory, and we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather here, Lord, to be able to just worship you, Lord, to, to be able to uh, sit at your feet, Lord, and, and allow you to speak to us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you move in our hearts and in our minds, remove any distractions and anything that might be uh, trying to uh, grab our attention away from listening to, to uh, the word. And I ask that you remove anything that may be in our hearts and in our minds that is of man, that is not of you, and replace it with your wisdom and your knowledge of the word. I also ask, Lord, that you bless um, everyone that, uh, that might not be feeling uh, good right now, Lord. I ask that you, uh, that you bring comfort upon them, Lord, and, and peace of mind, Lord, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and so, um, starting in verse 1, um, it says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elijah, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. <clears throat> so the sons of the prophets, as we, as we, as we have learned, is basically a, um, a ministry school or a school of ministry um, these are young men that um, are basically sitting under the direction of um, Elisha. Elijah had established these schools um, throughout that region and um, handed the, the, the responsibility over to Elijah uh, when it was time and when he was taken away. Um, and so these young prophets are um, basically in, in, in our times, we can call them seminary students. You know, they, they're, they're, uh, they're students of the word, you know, they're, they're sitting under um, 
this prophet and um, among other things, he's teaching them the word of God. And, and, and I'm sure he's he's teaching them um, how to obey it, you know, how to go about it, you know, what just like, you know, what we do um, when we sit here and we listen to um, our pastors and our teachers teach, you know, um, the word of God. You know, we're basically all seminary students. You know, it's not maybe we're not doing it for a certificate, but we're doing it to learn the word of God. And, and it challenges us, you know, to um, it challenges us to grow in the Lord, um, you know, and uh, these, these students uh, are doing the same thing. Um, one thing that is interesting is that um, they mentioned to Elijah, you know, that um, the place where we're at, where we dwell with you, is basically they're saying it's not big enough. And we're outgrowing it. Um, you know, um, you have heard it many times. Our pastor has told us that we're looking for a, a building. Um, one of the reasons is because um, there's times when... when um, when it seems like this is not adequate enough, I think we, we uh, Calvary Chapel Yuma, uh, at some points get to you know to a point where we, where we need something a little bit bigger, um, and that that's a good thing, because that means that the Lord is doing something and more people are coming, and we know that they're not coming because we put on a show, but they're coming because the Word of God is being preached and it's being taught here, and and that's a good thing, and and so, in in this, uh, um, in this uh, school of prophets, if I may, the same thing is happening. They, they're, they're growing, and God is doing something, and so they, they come up to um, their master, Elisha, and they tell him, you know, hey, um, you see, we're all growing this place. Um, and so they ask, please let us go to the Jordan, and, and each one of us will take a beam, and we may even build... Uh, a place to dwell, like an expansion. It's like, um, it reminds me of uh, when, when we first acquired the, the, the suite next door for the youth. Um, a bunch of people came together and we, we prepped that place up. Um, there was a, a wall that was put in between the, the big room, so we divided into two rooms. Um, just imagine that going on, you know, they, it's like they see the need and they notice how they don't say, well, how about we hire, we go and hire a, a, um, a construction company? Or how about we, we go and, and ask these people to do it for us? They, they're, they're ready to do it themselves. And that's what I saw here at Calvary Chapel Yuma. You know, people that were ready and said, hey, there's a need. It needs to be done. Rolled up their sleeves and, and set the time aside to be able to, to help out in whatever way they can. And, and, not, and not only in that instance, I've seen it many uh, times happen here. So we see that, they, that they're willing to work. They're willing to put in uh, the effort because the ministry is growing. And they want to make sure that, um, that what, what needs to be done is done and uh, you know, definitely they don't want to, they don't want to miss out on the blessing. Um, but one thing that they, uh, that I noticed, they asked the master, you know, can we go? You know, it, it's not like they just took it upon themselves and started doing it. They recognize the authority and um, they, they go and ask him, you know, for basically for permission. Um, and his response is, um, Go. You know, and, and you're going to see that, um, you know, uh, here at, um, at our church, you know, you're going to see that, that when, when there's a vision that, that God has given our pastor and the people, the congregants, the leaders, they, they come with an idea to the pastor and it lines up with his vision. Um, and he knows that that's God given in his body, given everybody uh, what they need to to accomplish this, and God, um, and the pastor will be like, "Yeah, go, let's do this." Um, verse three says, "Then one said, please consent to go with your servants," and he answered, "I will go.'" <clears throat> so at this point, uh, they asked him, "You know, please join us. You know, we're, we want to do this, but you know, would you come with us?" And notice how he says, "I will go." 
Um, I love that because <clears throat> not only are the, the students uh, willing to work to get the job done, uh, but also <clears throat> we see that the leader, the master, just because he's the director, he doesn't say, no, I'm too busy, you guys go, and I got more important things to tend to. Um, he, on the contrary, he says, <clears throat> I will go. Um, reminds me and brings to mind um, the, the mission trip that, the, that, the, that our family's in right now, um, our, our, um, our youth and, and some of the parents and leaders, um, <clears throat> including our pastor, decided to go uh, on this mission trip uh, to go um, serve to, to people out in Mexico, out in Rosarito. Um, some, some that are of the faith, others that, that, that perhaps they're not, but we, we're praying that, that what, um, what happens is that they come to know Christ through what, um, what God lays on their heart to do for them, um, whether it's play a game of soccer or, um, you know, serve it and, and, ha and have a VBS for the kids, whatever the case may be, that they see that, you know what, there is people that, that love God, that, that, that serve Christ, and that are willing to, to take a whole week to, to leave the comfort of their own home and go to this place where they, some of them probably have never been before, some of them probably don't know anybody there, but they're willing to just serve them and love on them because that's what Christ has called us to do. You know, the pastor could have easily said, well, you guys go and, um, and you know, I got things to do. I got, you know, messages to, to preach and whatnot. No, he, he basically rolled up his sleeves and said, okay, yeah, I will go with you. Um, I love the way, <clears throat> you know, that, uh, and it's not only here. You see that in, in churches all across where the pastor is willing to, to do what needs to be done. I was once told about a, a, an instance where at uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, um, Pastor Chuck Smith was uh, between services, was walking by uh, the women's restroom and there was a long line and, and he was like, what's going on? And they said, oh, we're waiting for uh, a plumber to come because the toilet is clogged. And uh, so we're waiting for the plumber. They, somebody went to go call him. Um, and Pastor Chuck Smith just took off his coat, rolled up his sleeve, and went in the, in, the, in the restroom where the toilet was clogged, and his hand went in that toilet and pulled out what needed to be pulled out and unclogged it, and went and washed his hands, and, you know, and I love that, you know, that, that's awesome, because he could have easily said, okay, well, make sure you tell him to get here on the double, but on the contrary, he was willing to roll up his sleeve and do what needed to be done. Um, you know, and I'm sure the ladies were very grateful for that. <clears throat> Verse 4 says, So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So they're cutting down the trees, they're, they're chopping down wood, um, and there's this uh, one of them, one of the students that is, is uh, cutting down a tree. And while he's cutting it, the iron axe head falls off the handle and, um, and cries out and says, for it was borrowed. Um, you have to remember in, in these times we see iron, metal, um, you know, in our times like it's nothing, you know. We get uh, screwdrivers made of metal in some of the furniture that we buy, and they're throwaways, you know. Um, but in this time, um, iron was very expensive, and it wasn't um, easy to come by. So you can imagine, especially if it was borrowed. Now, th th there is some, some uh, um, disagreement, or, or, or some commentators believe that it wasn't borrowed, uh, that it was actually a gift. Others believe that it was borrowed. Um, and I think that that's, um, that's, again, you know, whether it was a gift or it was borrowed, um, the fact of the matter is that the that, that student cried out and, and uh, knew the, 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 the value of that iron head. Plus the fact that he knew that without that axe head, he wasn't going to be able to continue working, you know. Um, so he, he, he cried out. Verse 6 says, so the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him with 
he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Another, um, another um, thing that, that people um, have different views on is this, this is what happened here. Um, the reason why I bring it up, some people believe that, that the iron head didn't really float. Um, some commentators believe that he threw the stick in, in, in the water. It went into the hole where the, the iron head had, where the handle went, and that's how he brought it up. Others believe that he threw the stick and it went under the iron head and it lifted it up. Me and, and, uh, and a lot of commentators out there believe that, no, it was God doing the miracle. The reason why I want to mention that is because it goes to show back in uh, um, chapter 5, you know, when Naaman was told that to go and wash in the Jordan seven times and, you know, he, he was upset because... That's, it was that simple, like, really, that's all I have to do? You know, it goes to show how our hearts, as, as human beings, want to see, want, want to explain something. You know, want, there's got to be a reason for that, you know, logical reason our, our, it, that, that fits within our way of thinking, you know. It, it, it's, and, and, and I'll be, you know, I'll confess to you, sometimes there are times when I hear that God has done something, and whether it's in the scriptures or through testimony. And then I'm thinking, well, maybe it was just everything was, you know, was lined up at, at the right time. You know, um, I don't I don't use the word coincidence, but I just tend to say, well, maybe, you know, th there's there's this um, things were happening that the person didn't know. And they truly believe that it was just God. And it's like, you know, well, whether it was other people and whether things were lined up, recognize and, and, and know that it was God who lined everything up. So whether it was something supernatural or if it was natural, the fact of the matter is that God made it happen and to God be the glory. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's kind of funny how we, we want to kind of overthink things sometimes and make them more uh, difficult than they really are. So <clears throat> there's, uh, there's five or four things, excuse me, that, that I noticed in reading this scripture. Um, four observations, um, and I wanted to share them with you. Um, I think it's, it, this message is more for uh, us believers, those of us who are walking with Christ, um, because it's, it's, you know, when, 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 you, when you're working in the ministry, when you have been walking with the Lord, and, and then you find yourself in a place where you don't, you, you don't have it doesn't feel or you feel like like there's something missing like it's not like it used to be um you know there's like i'm not as sharp as i used to be like you know like that x head you know i'm not as sharp as i used to be so what is missing what what, what am i you know what, what do i have to do and i think these four observations are gonna definitely um um give us uh, our answer. The first one is cry out. I get this from verse 5. It says, but as uh, one was cutting down a tree, the iron, axe fell, the iron axe fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. So he cried out. And I think the first thing that we um, need to do is cry out, cry out to the Lord. Um, you know, Psalm 77, 1 says, I cry out to God. I cry out to God and he hears me. You know, <clears throat> that's, that's the first thing we need to do is cry out to God. You know, when we feel like, like, like what we were feeling at the beginning, what, that, the, that there's, there's not that fire in us that used to be when, when we first um, started walking with the Lord, um, the first thing we need to do is cry out to the Lord. Um, and he, as Psalm says, you know, I cry out to God and he hears me. You know, Second Chronicles um, 7.14 says, My people who are called by my name, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So whether it's because of, of some sin that you may be committing or just, um, you know, you're complacent. You're just, you know, you're, you're taking the things of God as like, eh, you know, I'm just going to church. It's, it's another Sunday. It's another Wednesday, another fellowship, you know, but that your heart's not in it. Your, your body's there. But your heart and your mind are perhaps starting to wander away from the Lord and, and into other things, uh, whether it's because of worries, too. You know, a lot of times worries can, can pull us away from, from what the most important things are, and that's, you know, God. Um, here we, we're told that, that you know, the, the Lord tells us through His Word that those who are called by by his name, we have to humble ourselves and crying out to God is, is basically us humbling ourselves, you know, and not just a cry out uh, to God in a manner that, that you know, you know uh, yelling at him, but, but in a way that you humble yourself before him. You recognize that it's because of you, you know, because God is faithful. It's not us that are faithful in, in our walk. God is faithful and he's always there and he's always willing to to talk with us, to walk with us. He's always willing to hear us. It's us that walk away from him. It's us that stop reading the word or, or stop praying. Um, you know, it, it's us that let our attention get drawn to other things. Um, and so he says that, that if um, we pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear us from heaven. Forgive our sin and heal our land. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. You know, that's when, when we're brokenhearted and crushed in spirit and, and we come to the Lord like that, that's when the Lord is closest to us. We can't come to the Lord in a way like, it's because of you that I don't feel this fire. It's because of you that I'm going through what I'm, you know, that I'm going through the things that I'm going through, you know, it's your fault. No, you know, or this haughty spirit, you know, that I deserve. I've served you for this long and, and, and this, is, this is the thanks I get. No, we can't come to God like that. It's, it's, the, it's the humbling. It's the broken spirit, the, 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 the broken hearted and the Christian spirit that God is, is closest to. And we, we must remember that. <clears throat> the next observation after crying out, is return. And I get that from the first part of verse 6. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. You say, you see, uh, Elijah asked him, where is it that, that you last had it? And he went and took him there. When you feel like you don't have that fire that you used to have, return to the things that you were doing. Go back to what it was that you were doing at the beginning. Is that not what Jesus tells the church in Ephesus um, in Revelation chapter 2? He tells them, you have left your first love. So he, he, he tells them, you have left it. I haven't moved away from you. You have left it. Then he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. So remember where you were at when you fell. Remember what things you used to do before you fell. And then it says, repent and do the first works. Repent. Go back, cry out in a, in a, in a broken-hearted way. Humble yourself before me and, and do the first works. In other words, go back to what you were doing when you were on fire for me. Go and, 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 and pray more. Go and read the word. Tell people about Jesus at your workplace. You know, um, <clears throat> Just do whatever it is that you were doing when you were on fire for me. You know, um, Lamentations 3.40 tells us, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. You know, notice how it says examine and probe our ways. Examine ourselves. Examine where we're at. What it, what, why is it that I'm feeling the way I'm feeling? Why is it that, 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 that my heart is the way it is? And then says, and let us return to the Lord. So after examining yourselves and, and you find out that it's, you, it's me who have strayed from the Lord, who have, who have kind of taken another route and it seems like the gap between the Lord and I are, is starting to grow bigger and bigger. 
return to him. Stop, right, stop yourself in your tracks. Examine yourself. Find out where you're at. As the Lord said, <clears throat> remember, remember from where you have fallen and, and, and go back to the first works. You know, what was it that you were doing when you were uh, uh, serving the Lord? When you were, <clears throat> you couldn't wait, you know, for, for Sunday to come around or for Wednesday or for the men's uh, uh, dinner and Bible study or for the women's Bible study on Tuesdays or whatever else. But just to be in with the family, you know, and you know that the word of God is going to be um, the main focus, you know, and now you've you've kind of like. You know, uh, yeah, it's it's another one. Uh, I think I, I won't go today. <clears throat> and this is not a guilt trip because I, I know we all have uh, responsibilities. Some of us have families, others have uh, jobs and whatnot. But when you have that time and and if you remember, you know, every every free uh, every free time, free time that you had, you used to go and, and open up the word of God, whether it's on your on your app, on the phone or 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 the Bible, and see what the Lord had for you. The first thing you used to do when you woke up in the morning is, is think of Him and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because I'm able to wake up in the comfort of my own bed. And, and then what, what do you have for me today? And you read your devotional. What is it, you know, um, that you were doing? In, and uh, return, return to the Lord. Job twenty two twenty three 23 says, If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tent, you see, <clears throat> examine yourself. And if you if there's something that you're doing that, you know, doesn't um, you should not be doing that, you know, that is sin, then remove it, cast it out, return to the almighty, you know, ask the Lord for forgiveness. And um, in, in first John, it tells us that that if we uh, confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to, to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So all it takes is for us to, to go back to the Lord, confess our sins, repent from it, and then say, Lord, you know, put this fire back in me. I want to I wanna be on fire. This 4th of July, we were, uh, my wife and I were at the, at the uh, baptisms, and we had the, the pleasure to sit with a, a sister who, has, who hasn't been coming here for too long. <clears throat> but the way she was talking um, was reminding me of when I was first walking with the Lord and, you know, it was like the fire in there. And it was funny because I didn't say nothing, but I was just listening to her and I was like, that's awesome. And uh, when, on our way home, my wife mentioned it, you know, man, she's on fire. I rem you know, that's awesome. And this and that. I said, yeah, you noticed it too. That's, that's pretty cool. And, and I think that the Lord sometimes brings those people into our, into our lives to remind us of where we need to go back to. You know, it, it, we should always be walking like it's our first day with the Lord, like, like Jesus just broke the chains and freed us yesterday, and we want to tell everybody about Jesus, I think. And I think it's possible, but we have to really seek the Lord, seek His face, and, and call out to Him. You know, uh, return to the Almighty, and so that He can, so he can be uh, um, glorified through our lives, you know, that, that we, may per, we may proclaim his, his good works and what he can do, what he has done for us and what he can do for the people around us, uh, those that, that are brokenhearted, uh, those that uh, are lost, you know, our family members, our co-workers, our friends. And, and you know, and I think that that, that is definitely one thing that, that we must do is after we cry out to the Lord, uh, return to the Lord. And the next thing would be um, throw. And I get that from the second part of verse 6. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Now remember, when Elijah <clears throat> did this, when he cut a branch off a, off a tree and threw it in the, in, the, in the water where the iron axe head had fell, um, he was doing this in front of Bible students. So I'm sure they were reminded of the, of the story that, uh, from Exodus 20. Um, when uh, the Israelites, after crossing the Red Sea, came to uh, Mara, which is literally, which means bitter. Um, and they, they had been walking the desert for a few days without water, and they come to a place where there's finally water. But when they go in and take a drink, it's bitter. And, um, and they started complaining. 
But in verse 25 of chapter 20 of Exodus, it says that Moses cried out to the Lord. Notice how he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. When that tree, which is a picture of the cross, was cast into the bitter waters, then the waters were made sweet. And that, you know, is a picture of our lives. It's a picture that our lives, the water of life, is bitter without Jesus. You know, we walk this life without Jesus, and, and although we have a mask with a smile on our face, and, and we walk around with this joy that could be, uh, um, it's not a true joy, it's not real joy, but it's happiness, and it only lasts for um, a certain amount of time, and then it's gone. Um, but for the most part, we're bitter, whether we want to admit it or not. Deep down inside, we're walking because we, we're, we're walking apart. We're walking apart from what God has created us to walk. We, we, we're not in that relationship in communion with God, which is the reason why we were created. And so naturally, our, our soul is going to be bitter because we're not doing what, what God had crea has created us to do. And, but when you come to the cross then your life is made sweet, you know, and I, and I, I want to make sure I tell you that it doesn't mean that, I mean, most of you, if not all of you are Christian in here, you've been walking with the Lord. You know that, that coming to the Lord doesn't mean that, that the problems go away. No, the problems do not go, do not go away. It's just now you have the Lord there to sustain you, to hold you. And so, with that being, you know, a, a reminder that, you know what, the waters of life may be bitter. And, and when you come to the cross and you, you cast your burdens on the Lord, your life is, is, is this joy and true joy. And your life is different. You're walking around with, with a, glow, a glow in your face. And it's because that... The, the, you've come to the cross, you've, you've surrendered to Christ, and you've recognized that it is because of Him that, um, that you're, you're still living. You know, 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, when he said, throw all your worry on Him because He cares for you. I'm sure he was not only quoting from uh, Psalm 55, 22, that says, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. But he was saying that because he remembered what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, my friend, I can tell you that we are all burdened. We are all tired. Some of us from work, you know, some of us from just living life, because this, especially nowadays, everything is, you know, just go, 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 go. You know, and, and physically we can be tired. And there's a reason why the Lord wants us. There's a reason why the, one of the Ten Commandments was the, 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 the Sabbath, because we are to rest, but not rest only from, from our physical, but also rest from, from what our spiritual, what, what we a lot of times burden ourselves with, even within the ministry, we're so caught up in serving and serving and serving that we never give our time to actually draw to the Lord, you know, and, see, and just sit at His feet, you know, uh, like Martha and Mary, uh, when Jesus showed up to their house and um, He was visiting, Martha was busy cooking up a meal, you know, and and and... People that have gone to my mom's house, you can ask my, my wife. My mom's like, hey, I, um, I have leftovers. I'll whip up a meal too, but I have so many leftovers. And I think that's awesome because it's almost like she's always expecting somebody to come over and she's willing to just start heating it up and serve you. And that gives her time to be able to sit down and talk to you and see, how, how have you been? How are you doing? And, uh, and I... I think that's how we ought to be. We, we, there's a lot of times where we need to just stop what we're doing and rest upon the Lord. You know, um, He is our rest. 
you know, the fact that 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 um, at that time th there was Jews that thought that they had to continue, that they had to work for their salvation when Christ was telling them, look, rest. If you come to me, you'll rest from all that. You won't need to go and and have to worry about taking a, a, a sacrifice to the temple, uh, you know, once a year and 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 all that, all the works to be right with God. You don't have to work because I'm going to do it. And, and imagine <clears throat> these people that were hearing those words, perhaps were probably thinking like, you know, how am I going to find rest with you? Not knowing what he was, what, uh, was telling them at that time. So throw again, our observation throw. <clears throat> you cry out, you return to the Lord. I would say by throwing yourself on your knees and seeking him. You know, and throwing all your burdens upon him because he will sustain you. He will care for you. I know there's people in here that have worries. We all do. Some of them have bigger worries. I, you know, I worry about um, what faces me tomorrow at work, uh, what, what, what task I have to do. But there's people in here that, that have bigger worries than that. And if I were to sit down and, and talk to some of you and tell me what, what worries you have on your heart, I, mine would probably be at the very bottom of the list in, as far as um, importance or, or you know, it, I, would, I would feel ashamed because I'm worrying about that when you have bigger things to worry about. But regardless, the Lord said, you know, come to me and I will give you rest. And the last observation is reach. So after you've cried out and you've returned to the Lord and you've thrown all your, your, your worries upon Him, you reach. And I get that from verse 7 where he says, Therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Does not 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tell us, For we walk by faith and not by sight? You see, this young man saw <clears throat> the, the axe head flow. He, he held it in his hand. He knew that it was heavy, but he saw the impossible happen. Now, he could have been filled with doubt and say, no, this is not happening. This is uh, uh, an illusion or just a, a figment of my imagination. This is, this is not really happening. But Elijah tells him, you reach. Elijah could have easily picked it up himself and said, here you go. But no, he says, you reach and pick it up for yourself. And I think that's awesome. Um, Jesus, uh, you know, on Sundays we're going through uh, the Gospel of Mark. And a lot of things that we've seen um, is the miracles that Jesus has, has been doing up to, um, I think it's chapter 9 that we're in now. And, um, but there's a lot of miracles that Jesus did that... He could have just had it done without the participation of the people that were present or that were actually being healed. Um, in chapter 1, uh, Jesus heals a leper. And in verse 40, it says, and this is now in, in the Gospel of Mark. In verse 40 of chapter 1, he says, now, uh, it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. You see, the leper made an effort to go to him, asking him, begging him, kneeling before him. You know, he could have just cried out from afar and said, hey, Jesus, heal me. No, he, he made that effort to go. You know, he, he put in that effort and Jesus made him and, and Jesus cleansed him. In chapter two, he heals a paralytic. And in verses three and four, it says that, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. You see, these four men knew the power that Jesus had. And they didn't just go and tell him about Jesus. They picked up this paralyzed man and took him to Jesus. But not only that, because listen to what it says. And, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they turned the other way and gave up. Or they... They, they threw the, the, the paralyzed man as close to Jesus as they could. No, it says they uncovered the roof where he was, where Jesus was. And so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. You see, they, they made that effort. 
And you, you think Jesus did not know when he saw uh, those four men coming to him that you think that Jesus was not aware of what, who they were bringing and what, what he was in need of? No, he was well aware. And he could have easily just moved the crowd to the side and gone out to him. But I believe that Jesus let, allowed, allowed everything to play out to show not only the people there, but also us and, and throughout all our, our previous generations what faith is capable of. You know what? If I can't reach Jesus through this crowd, I'm going to find a way. And these four men, they weren't even seeking a miracle for themselves. They were seeking it for, for this uh, paralyzed man. It could have been a friend, a family member. You know, what, what are we doing? So, you know, are we enacting our faith? Are we walking out our faith for those people around us? It says in verse 11 and 12, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. So Jesus tells him, after everything that played out, he tells him, he tells him to get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all. And it goes on to tell us that that man was glorifying God, praising the Lord. You know, that's, that's again, the people, Jesus could have done it all, healed them from far away and didn't even have to have a conversation with him, but allowed him to play a part in his own healing by, by having his friends bring him. And not only that, when he tells them, I say to you, arise, and he goes up and, and believes that the faith that that man has, because he had been paralyzed, who knows for how long, but he's willing to say, you know what, at his word, I'm going to go ahead and get up. In chapter 5, he heals a woman on his way to bring a young, back, a young girl back to life. Verse 27 and 28, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You see, again, the woman is making an effort to, to get to, to Jesus so that she may be well. In chapter 6 and 8, he feeds thousands of people. And both times, he has the disciples participate in the miracle. Remember, he takes the bread, he breaks it, and he puts it before them so that they can go and pass it out to the people, the fish also. You see how Jesus is, it, he's almighty and he can just make the bread and the fish appear in front of people and doesn't need to use the disciples, but he goes and does that. At that we, we see a pattern here. In chapter 7, he cast out a demon from a Gentile woman's daughter after she demonstrates her faith by coming to Jesus and by crying out to him. In chapter 7 and 8, he heals a deaf mute and a blind man. Both, instance, both instances, he uses spit to perform the miracle. I don't know about you, but if, if Jesus, if I was that man, I, it'd probably be hard for me to, to allow somebody to spit in their hand and start rubbing it on their eyes or on, their, or on my ears or in, in my, you know, on my tongue. But the faith that they had, you know, perhaps it was the desperation, but the fact, I'm not, it doesn't matter how desperate I am, I don't think I would let something like that happen. But their faith, they allowed it to happen and they were made whole. But the, the, the one that I like the most, and I think that, that it, it relates to this message is in chapter three of Mark where he heals a man with a withered hand. Verse, the second part of verse 5 says, He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. You see, Jesus told him, stretch it out. And the, what did the man, did he say, Jesus, do you not see my hand? I cannot because it's withered. No, by faith, because the Lord was telling him to do it, he went ahead and stretched out his hand. He reached out his hand. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. I love what David Guzik uh, uh, said about this regarding this uh, back to our story in, in Kings chapter 6. He says, conceivably, God could have arranged a way for the axe head to appear right in the man's hand without any effort on his part. But this miracle worked in a familiar way. God did the part only he could do, but he left to man the part that he could do. You see, I, and, it, and it's awesome. It's a blessing to be able to uh, be part of, of, of God's work here on earth. You know, a lot of times we can be so caught up in the ministry that, that we see it as a burden. 
but no, it's 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 a blessing. It's not a burden. You know, when you when you see the way God is transforming people's lives because you're discipling them, you you're seeing it firsthand. You know, the, the time you're spending with them, when you see them first come to the Lord and then years later you see them only growing and growing uh, in the Lord, you know, in their walk and in, in, in the word. It's like, you know, it, it encourages you. You know, that's the ironing, the iron sharpening the, the iron, you know. Um, but all this has to it has to be and it has been done by faith. You know, uh, Hebrews 11 one tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Because in verse 6 it tells us, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who dig diligently seek Him. <clears throat> faith. Faith that when we cry out to God, <clears throat> He hears us. Faith that when we return to him, he's not going to cast us out. He's not going to forsake us. He's not going to be standing there with his arms crossed saying, oh, what do you want from me now? Oh, now you're coming back to me. No, on the contrary, faith that he's going to be there with his arms open like the, like the father was with the, um, with the prodigal son, that he ran out to him and received him. Faith that when, we, when he tells us to cast our burdens upon him, he is going to care for us. That we cast... All our worries upon the Lord. He sustains us. He cares for us. And faith that when He tells us to reach out, we're going to reach out. Not because we see what's going to happen, but because we know that the Lord's going to make something happen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we, we thank You, Lord, for, for Your love and Your mercy, Your grace, Your faithfulness, Your goodness. Lord, we're so undeserving of everything that you have given us, Lord. But because you loved us, that's, that's the reason why we're still here. Because you love us, Lord. We love you because you first loved us. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to be able to serve you, Lord. And to be able to be part of the miracles that you're doing here on earth, Lord. These, these great men and women that, that walked with you, Lord, before you came on this earth as a man and even afterwards, Lord. As we read in your word, Lord, that they walk by faith, Lord. That's, that's how my plea is to you, Lord, that, that we may walk by faith, Lord, knowing that you're going to be faithful and you're going to do what you are going to do, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Lord, I ask that you, that you bless every single soul here, Lord, and, and listening to this message, Lord. And if there's anything, Lord, that, that they may be worrying, Lord, that they take you at your word and that they cast those worries upon you, Lord, knowing that you're going to sustain them and you're going to give them strength, Lord. Lord, I ask that, that you continue to just work in our lives, Lord. Forgive us if we've walked away from you, Lord, if we've done things, Lord, or not done things, Lord, that we used to do that drew us closer to you, Lord. If we've done things that... that have been disobedient to you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. And fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>